I want to preface this one with a disclaimer. I don't expect to cover absolutely everything pertaining to chipsets in this video, and that's why I titled it the way that I did. I do expect, however, to provide a detailed description of what a chipset is to an extent and why it matters in a system, as well as what kinds to look for in various builds. Beginners especially, pay close attention here. This video is brought to you by Privacy.com. In a nutshell, Privacy.com allows you to purchase things online using virtual debit card numbers instead of real ones. This is useful, especially if you plan on ordering from sites with questionable security standards, and it's still peace of mind for the popular online retailers like Amazon and Newegg. Privacy.com boasts the same security standards as your bank, and split key encryption ensures no single person can access your data. By the way, you can download the browser extension and have it autofill the info for any of your virtual cards like this. It's super simple, secure, and best of all, 100% free since they make money on the merchant side like that of credit card companies. Give it a try via the link below or by visiting privacy.com slash science studio for a free $5 credit toward your first purchase. So let's start off by defining a chipset. And in its most basic form, a chipset with respect to personal computers is a controller for discrete and onboard hardware. You see, in the good old days, right, simple chipsets were scattered all across a motherboard. You had one for controlling your graphics card, one for controlling sound, and that's why there were so many to begin with. Uh, anything you want to connect to your motherboard would require a discrete chip. The layouts took up too much space, pipelines weren't streamlined, and latency was actually pretty high if the chipsets themselves were clocked relatively low. By the way, even today, various companies produce chipsets including Nvidia, AMD, and Intel, and it, it makes sense really for a majority of these manufacturers to handle things in-house since chipsets need to be tuned specifically for the hardware that they'll be uh, linking to and controlling. But things eventually merged on the IC level into North Bridge and South Bridge, where the North Bridge connected via the front side bus and consisted of IC sensitive to low latency tasks, such as the communication between a CPU and system RAM, for example, or a graphics card. Now, the South Bridge, which was located much further down on the board, instead controlled SATA ports, networking, audio, and other, you know, basically less sensitive aspects aspects of a personal computer, things that weren't as time sensitive. And we saw motherboards with North Bridges all the way up to the AMD FX lineup, whose AM3 and AM3 Plus chipsets maintained both North and South counterparts. Today, however, nearly all of what a North Bridge typically handles is controlled via the CPU, which would normally go up here. Remember, North Bridge would be somewhere in this space. So memory controllers, for example, are now totally CPU integrated and started back with the AMD64 and Intel Nihilum processors. In fact, Sandy Bridge was one of the first CPU families to fully integrate the controllers of a typical North Bridge, which eliminated the need for one altogether, and also managed to pack the memory controller, IGP, and several processor cores, all into a die that's not much larger, actually in the case of Sandy Bridge, a little smaller than the surface area of a quarter. So you can see the trend here. Technology's goal is to minimize real estate and maximize efficiency, and today we've completely absorbed large chunks of controllers and integrated most, if not all of them, into the CPU. We're talking about the CPU die specifically, and that's why I use the quarter analogy because what you're looking at typically when you see a CPU is the IHS or that large piece of metal over the die itself. So what about the South Bridge? Well, it's evolved just a little bit and it's named different things depending on who you ask, which is really annoying. So Intel calls theirs the ICH or the PCH, it stands for IO or Platform Controller Hub, and AMD refers to theirs as the FCH or Fusion Controller Hub. You'll almost never hear these terms in PC tech though because nobody really cares to separate them. They do very similar things. So most enthusiasts just refer to them as chipsets or South Bridges. We'll, we'll call them chipsets for the remainder of this video just so you don't have to hear me keep saying PCH and FCH. So to recap, the South Bridge handles things like USB controllers, the audio interface, the internet connection. It still does quite a bit, but these processes again aren't typically as time sensitive. It communicates with the CPU via the direct media interface or the unified media interface. Again, very annoying. That's for Intel and AMD respectively, both of which were the same methods used by the South and North Bridges in the past, by the way. Speeds here are still pretty quick, somewhere in the realm of like eight gigatransfers per second per lane, which comes out to roughly four gigabytes per second when four lanes are in use. This eliminates any potential bottleneck for lower tier controllers like SATA, which currently cap out at around six gigabits per second. Remember, divide by eight if you wanna go from bits to bytes. It's a bit confusing. I don't blame you for getting those mixed up. An often overlooked aspect, by the way, of PCH or 
FCH, I should just be calling them chipsets, uh, it's annoying, is the control over a few PCIe lanes. So most of these slots on your motherboard communicate directly with either your CPU or your chipset. Uh, in the case of the CPU, it's an ultra low latent data tunnel between the discrete hardware and your CPU. This is the beauty of peripheral component interconnect express. That's PCIe, just wanted to sound a bit smart there. Uh, but the chipset handles a few lanes as well. And again, it depends on the type of chipset that you have. Uh, so you could in theory connect PCIe storage drives like NVMe drives in this fashion. Your motherboard manual will typically denote which slot is controlled by the chipset or which ones can be controlled by it. Uh, so you just have to remember that, you know, if you add more devices to it, like hard drives, SATA uh, drives, basically any SATA drive, SSDs, or even USB drives to your system, you'll be occupying some of these chipsets chipset lanes by default, so you won't have as many to use uh, or to offload onto the PCIe lanes. Now on to the hardware compatibility. Because you understand the basics with respect to communication between the chipset and the CPU, it makes sense to assume that uh, not all chipsets can coexist with certain CPUs, right? For one, you've got the AMD Intel division. Obviously, sockets aside, I mean, you can't run an Intel CPU with an AMD motherboard or vice versa because we're talking about an AMD chipset. Uh, so the protocols and instructions sent to and from the chipset in question are essentially in different orders and different languages per se. So even if you could power a modern Intel chip with say an AM4 board, which would be really weird and extremely cool, uh, you couldn't, you know, let's assume that you could also like retrace pinouts so that RAM compatibility was solid. Your storage drives for one would have no way to communicate with your CPU. Your BIOS wouldn't either. So you probably couldn't get the system to boot. It would just power on. So yeah, as such, here are your modern consumer grade AMD chipsets. We're gonna go ahead and roll into those. Uh, what I have right here is a B450 motherboard, meaning that there is a B450 chipset packed underneath this. Uh, should we call it a heat sink? I think that's doing it more justice than it deserves. It's like a, it's basically a metal plate. It looks Looks very nice. So you've got A320, B350, B450, X370, and X470. I'm ignoring enthusiast grade hardware like Threadripper in this video. I don't advise beginners to begin their careers uh, in PC tech with X399 or X299 systems. Most people won't even utilize that many cores to begin with. By the way, I may miss a few derivatives here and there, uh, but these are the ones that you're more likely to see on sites like Newegg and Amazon. All of these chipsets are compatible with all of these CPUs, assuming you flashed a compatible BIOS. More on that in this video right here. X3 and X470 chipsets are the most expensive and feature packed by comparison. So you'll often see added compatibility for Crossfire and SLI, for example, uh, a more advanced onboard audio system and additional storage drive support. You'll also typically see additional PCIe lanes, meaning you connect more drives and other things to your motherboard without having to cut into other lanes that other hardware might already be using. In short, the cheaper the board is, the more of these features you'll have stripped from you in an effort to save costs on both ends of the transaction. That kind of makes sense. And for reference, B and X series chipsets in the case of AMD support overclocking. I've got a few solid boards linked down below in the video description that I have first hand experience with if you are interested. Next up is Intel. You've got H310, B250, B360, H270, H370, Z370, uh, Z270, and Z390. Yeah, Intel's... Uh, a slightly different story. And to be honest, compatibility isn't even guaranteed all the way through this lineup. So you can't just go out and buy an i9 CPU and make it run on a Z170 board. People have done it in the past. It requires modding, BIOS tweaking, but it's not advised. And to be honest, the power load uh, from a CPU like that probably couldn't be handled uh, by the MOSFETs VRMs on a Z170 board because those chips were a lot less intense when it came to power draw. Uh, so when you throw something that power hungry into it, those can get extremely hot, run out of spec, and then you'll have uh, even more substantial issues further down the line. So I recommend with Intel sticking to boards that line up directly with each other, boards that were released at the same time as their CPU counterparts. And uh, this is gonna require a bit of digging. I could list them all out for you, uh, but I have instead linked one of Intel's chipset catalogs down below in the video description so it can give you an idea of what chipsets can be used with which CPUs. And unlike AMD, only Z series chipsets boast unlock multipliers or allow for unlock multipliers. So make sure you buy one of these if you intend to purchase a K-series CPU. Again, it can get confusing, but a site like PC Part Picker can really help. Uh, they're not a sponsor by any means. I just feel like giving you all the help 
that you can get. Uh, and PC Part Picker is a great site. It'll even tell you if it detects incompatibility uh, and it'll suggest motherboards based on your CPU choice and customer feedback. It'll let you know if your motherboard fits in a certain case. Uh, it's a very helpful website. Uh, so again, if you haven't heard of PC Part Picker, you're really missing out. Click that link below and uh, yeah, you'll thank me later. So in closing, I hope you've at least learned a thing or two about what chipsets are and why they are so important. You know, in the least, maybe you just had a quick refresher and I appreciate you watching this far into the video. Pay special attention to the chipsets when selecting your next motherboard, especially you guys beginners, and purchase based on what you need in the immediate future. So when people ask me, you know, which board should I get? I can't answer for you unless you give me total context. I need to know if you care about Crossfire and SLI, if you care about 7.1 audio, if you care about having two RJ45 ports, if you care about having HDMI and DisplayPort, um, how it's built into the motherboard. There are so many variables at play, uh, and frankly, the chipset is just one of those things. So we could actually make an entire series out of talking about all the different motherboard features, uh, but chipsets are a big aspect of um, you know choosing a motherboard. So I want you guys to uh, have at least a little bit of context into why they're important and why you should consider them uh, when deciding to build your next PC. Best of luck to those who are watching this video and have absolutely no idea what they're gonna do, what they're gonna build. Maybe this is your first build ever. I have plenty of videos on the channel that can help you out, build guides, all that stuff. And if you just wanna know about why things work the way they do, we have an entire playlist dedicated to uh, yeah, stuff like that, in-depth analyses, and then if you want more simplified stuff, you can check out our Minute Science playlist. If you guys like this video, thumbs up, thumbs down for the opposite feeling, you know what to do. Click that red subscribe button if you haven't already, and I'll catch you in the next video. This is Science Studio. I think this will be our last video for 2018, so uh, that's pretty cool. Happy 2019, everyone. I'll see you next year. All right, that joke's, joke's a little old. <laughs> this is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us. Going with a good old-fashioned outro there.